Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where we enjoy a good LARP every now and then, and where we may or may not be LARPing ourselves here. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging. I hope those of you who celebrated any sort of holiday recently enjoyed the shit out of it. I know I did. So much so that... I'm in the mood to gift you with what I think may be one of our finer, more thought-provoking episodes yet. It's a post-Christmas gift. Call me Hermes Christmas Giftus. Shout out to Dana Terrell. And a big shout out to our guest, Tracy Twyman, the lady thinking outside the gift box. Well, no, that's not entirely accurate. With Tracy, there is no box. And if you're familiar with her work, if you've read any of her books or blogs or heard her on other podcasts, you know what you're in for. If you're unfamiliar with Tracy, Jesus, tap dance in Christ, are you in for a sweet, sweet audio treat? Well, sort of. While the material presented here is high-grade sonic kush, we did have some audio issues here, and I am so very sorry for it. Tracy was on a cell phone and the connection was a bit spotty. She sounds a little hollow from time to time, which, if I think about it, is sort of appropriate considering some aspects of the conversation. Of course, I did my best to clean this up and balance it out, and it turned out okay. If you stick with it, though, trust me, this one gets good. So let's crank the volume on this one up to 58 and cast this pod off plus ultra style deep into the hidden hyperspace kingdom of the elite where LARPs are front page news, Mithras is the mayor, and a local sex shop sells sun-drenched diamond dildos. Enjoy. Tracy Twyman, thanks for being here. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem, no problem. You know, I'd like to start off on a personal note, and if I have a connection to somebody that they're unaware of, I'd like to brief them on that. So... Just grant me a moment here. I just want to tell you a quick story. About eight or ten years ago, I started writing a novel that actually was uh, turned into a series of novels. And I had kind of sketched out nine books in this series of novels. And I'm still working through it. But I'm not going to tell you what the plot is because it's kind of irrelevant. But the title that I gave to the entire series, which I know that you're familiar with, was actually Plus Ultra. Oh, (laughs) wow. And... I was not aware of your work back then. I was not even aware of what the phrase was connected to. I had done some basic searching on Latin phrases. And that was one of the ones that when I was searching through like a Latin phrase dictionary that that stuck out to me. I liked what it meant. It was pertinent to what I was writing about in the series of novels. And then here I am now. Uh, doing this podcast, I've been introduced to your work through this this genre of podcast, and lo and behold, you have an entire history with that phrase that I was completely unaware of. It's part of your membership section now, or it's the name of your patron section, I guess, on your website. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It's sort of a weird, it's a synchronicity that it's those kinds of things have been popping up a lot for me in the last couple of years, especially since I've been doing this podcast. So I do want to talk about Plus Ultra. For those of us that are unaware of what that means, you know, maybe take us through what that means and how it relates back to what we'll be talking about today. Well, it was a phrase that was affiliated with the Royal House of Spain, and they had put it on their coins after they started colonizing the New World, and they were, you know, mining gold and silver in tremendous amounts. And they were really proud of their accomplishments, so that's why they put this phrase and the, and the uh, logo that they did. They made it into their coat of arms and put it on their coins and stuff. It had the two pillars of Hercules represented as actual pillars, like of a of a building, two pillars, and then there was uh, a banner on uh, each one. That's one said plus, and the other said ultra. And the phrase means there is more beyond. So they were saying there's more to our empire beyond the pillars of Hercules and there's more stuff to be discovered. There's more land, there's more wealth and gold and silver and other wonderful things beyond the pillars of Hercules. They were just boasting about their accomplishments and the scope of their empire. And that phrase and that symbol is thought by some to be part of the evolution and the the influence on the dollar sign that we have, the 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 S with the line through it. Because these Spanish coins with the symbol on it, were the first coins called dollars in the American colonies. They were actually reals. They were Spanish reals, but people called them dollars. And sometimes they called them pillar dollars because they had the pillars on them. So anyway, it's um, it's a, a phrase that uh, is associated with a symbol that's part of the evolution of our, our money, the history of the money that we use here in the United States. 
it's also, and in fact, there's dollars all over the place, and uh, and I think they all use the same dollar sign, so it's it's you know part of all that heritage, the heritage of the dollar as it's used today, even the Australian dollar and uh, all the other ones. But the other thing is, it's just it has a um, broader application because. Is also sort of a symbol of everything that's kind of beyond the scope of normality. So, yes, it represents the old world, for, you know, from its perspective, looking at the bright future beyond the pillars of Hercules, the bright future of things that have not been explored yet. So it's been used in other contexts since then as a, a way of representing even going beyond into another dimension. And that's kind of what I've been focusing on in the last few years when I when I write about it. I'm usually talking about it in that aspect. And uh, I think that a, a good representation of, of how that interpretation of it has been around since the beginning almost uh, is, is when it was used in one of the book plates or no, one of the, um, I don't know it was, if it was the frontispiece, but it was one of the main illustrations in Novus Organum, the book by Francis Bacon, and it had a ship going through the two pillars of Hercules. And in, in, in that specific context, it represented going into unknown, not only the new world geographically, but scientifically, new information. Uh, so that's the way I'm using it, and, the, and that's the way that several other modern groups apparently have been using it, is just as a symbol of going off into the unknown, not only scientifically, geographically, but even in, in what I was saying in terms of physics and the dimensions that we're in, it's the idea of going and seeing th something from a higher, broader perspective. And in fact, one of the things I've been explaining to people lately in my writing and on some of the videos that I've put out is you can see this symbol in, or this concept in on the Masonic tracing boards and other Masonic symbols that include the pillars, especially when they have the three pillars. Sometimes they have two, but sometimes you can see the third one there also. And it's usually presented as being kind of off to the left. And you can tell it's, it looks like you wouldn't see the other pillar unless you were looking at it from the right angle. You know, if you were looking at it straight on, you would only see two pillars. But if you look at it from another angle, then you can see the third one in the background. And they'll often have a stairway going past that pillar, kind of off up into the sky, or a long, twisty road, kind of, again, peeling up into the sky, going up. So, and, it, and then they'll, at the end of that road or, or that ladder or that staircase, there'll be an opening in the sky. So it's showing you going through the pillars and going beyond. And that third pillar is like the third pole. And I'm literally talking about, you know, you can think of it geographically. They actually have the the directions of the compass written on the edge of this Masonic tracing board I'm thinking of where they have the three pillars. And so they show the sky, you know, that the um, the direction that's associated with the side of the picture, you know, where the sky is. You know, it's like at the bottom you have the ground, at the top of the picture is the sky, and then... You've got left and right. Well, the sky is the north, according to the compass that they have on this Masonic symbol, tracing board. So they're showing you a different way of thinking about dimensions and perspective, that going north could actually be going up. And, and you know, yeah, I don't want to, I guess maybe we need to have a little bit more explanation before I launch too deeply into this. But basically, we're literally talking about the idea that you could go travel to the North Pole and then travel beyond it and be going up and not just, you know, to the you know, around the ball to the other side, but that, you know, you can actually by going forward, start going up because you're traveling through the pillars to another dimension. I guess that's just one way of, uh, of explaining the idea that, that I, I see embedded in plus ultra. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a lot to unpack there for sure. And, you, know, you mentioned the third pole, and I think that's a good transition maybe perhaps into the fourth pole, which I call the pole on 4chan, uh, and what's <laughs> going on there right now. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Plus Ultra, 
does connect to this uh, this insider named QAnon, who's been dropping uh, what they call breadcrumbs on 4chan for the last couple of months. And then Plus Ultra connects to that. It also connects to Donald Trump. This connection to me is, is pretty fascinating. So I was wondering if, you know, if you don't mind, let's just explain what QAnon is, what's been going on there and how it relates to Trump and Plus Ultra. All right. Well, QAnon is a person claiming to be a White House insider and really a confidant of Donald Trump himself specifically. He implies that there's several conspiracies going on and that Trump only has a few people he can talk to that are on his side. And he claims that there's a a military coup afoot that he's presenting as a good thing. That he and his uh, friends, Donald, uh, cl- close to Donald Trump, are actually trying to get the new world order and arrest all the bad guys and take their money. And uh, it's it's implied that it's related to the Pizzagate phenomenon that all the people that need to be arrested have also been molesting children, and they're all part of this cabal that's controlling the world by controlling politicians through blackmail by setting them up with child prostitutes and then videotaping it. That part, I know that 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 is basically what runs the world. You know, that is true. That's how politicians are controlled. And uh, so that I I have no doubt that's going on. So that's what he's he's saying, basically, that uh, he's what it sounds like. He's trying to get somebody in the world to have some understanding that this this is what's going on so that there will be someone on his side if you were to take it literally and actually believe him, that they're trying to get someone on their side to understand what's going on when it will appear to everybody else that there's just this horrible military coup happening and we're going into martial law and this Nazi Donald Trump has taken over and you know this is the World War Three, this is the end, this is everything our parents warned us about and uh, you know <laughs> this worst chapter in history happening right now. But th- this guy is trying to scream out and say, no, no, it- it's not a bad thing. They're- the New World Order is actually the bad thing, and we're trying to put an end to it. So if you were to take it literally and seriously, then that's what he's saying. That's the message he's trying to convey. Now, of course, I mean, I don't know how much experience your listeners have with 4chan. And me, I only really know I've been on the X boards and I've been on the Paul board, which is the pol- politically incorrect board. I don't lurk on there other than that, and I don't always go there either. You know, it's not something I do every day. It's only when I hear that something juicy is being talked about on, usually on the POL, the poll, because lately, over the last year or two, that's been a place where information actually is dropped from insiders. And it's probably just because there's an audience there, there's a sympathetic audience, and you can do it anonymously. And the people on, I don't know about the rest of 4chan, but I know that certainly on Paul, they have a culture, a community of what they call themselves autists, right? So they're, they, it's kind of this joke that they're all somehow on the art- autistic spectrum. They have social problems. They're not very good uh, at, at socializing, but they stay at home on their computers doing research and, and geeking out on certain subjects. And so <laughs> the idea is that you would, if, you were an insider with a whistle to blow and you wanted to get some information out. You could do it on 4chan and specifically on Paul because uh, you could do it anonymously and then people will take the breadcrumbs that you drop and find out if there's something to it or not. You know, And actually, I think this is not a bad strategy because, yeah, uh, people can do what is happening to QAnon, which is he's getting attacked every uh, thread that he posts something new. He gets attacked for what they call LARPing. Which means, you know, live action role playing, like basically they're just saying that you're, you're a liar and you're joking, you're trolling us. And so anyway, and anyone who takes Q seriously gets attacked by that also. But if you could just somehow filter out all that in the midst of that, there are people who are actually taking the information and seeing if it's, you know, if it leads to anything, if it bears any fruit, if it helps them put together any connections. So basically, so one of the things, you know, they're QAnon is dropping details about, and sadly, a lot of it hasn't come to pass. There have been a lot of promises that we don't see the evidence of yet. But he's saying that there's hundreds of indictments, sealed indictments for people 
you know, famous people that we've all heard of uh, involved in politics and involved in business who, you know, supposedly are going to get arrested for everything from pedophilia to financial fraud and treason and all sorts of things. But the, the reality that this seems to go along with, and I'll, you know, this is all the stuff that most of it is the stuff that you could be, if you were a LARPer, just playing along with, like, oh, you know, it's, it's a convenient time to have a game like this because, for instance, what happened in Saudi Arabia where, you know, all those royals got arrested and they're, they're holding them in a hotel room, making them, or in the lobby of a hotel, making them sleep on the floor until they agree to give up 70% of their wealth because, you know, supposedly it's all ill-gotten gain and, and uh, they should, you know, give it back to the, get, give it back to the people, basically. So you could think, well, there's an example and that's that's uh, what QAnon has done is try to take credit for that and say, oh, that's part of the whole coup that's going on. And he says, you know, you can't believe the media. They're not going to tell you what's going on. John McCain and Hillary Clinton, for instance, they're, they're wearing uh, some sort of orthopedic boot because of some injuries that both of them had individually. But QAnon says, well, actually, that's just hiding their ankle bracelet because they're actually under <laughs> house yes. arrest waiting to be prosecuted. So that's all very interesting, and that's why I, I ended up going back to 4chan a couple, three weeks ago when, when uh, QAnon started posting a lot, saying that, well, it was back when the president was on his uh, his tour where he, he went to Saudi Arabia, then he went to all these places in Asia. And so the whole time he was gone, QAnon was telling people that, oh, you know, when he when he comes back, that's, that's when everything's going to get started, and he's going to make this big announcement. The only thing, everyone waited for this big announcement. The White House actually did say, we have a big announcement. I, I forget what he even said, because it was nothing. You know, when he finally came out and made his big announcement, it was a complete anticlimax. But he drank, he made this weird gesture of drinking Fiji water out of a bottle with both hands in this awkward manner that a lot of people have interpreted as being some kind of message. And I, in fact, have my own interpretation of it and the reason why someone would look for that is because in amidst all the stuff about all the criminal activity of various elites and i'm talking about people all over the world the saudi royal family the british royal family politicians in europe and in the united states england canada and hollywood even you know QAnon is trying to link that which i i see is not a bad claim you know it's it's it it lends a lot of credence to what he's saying all the people that are getting in trouble in Hollywood for uh, for sex offenses, all of them have been rendered mute now. They, like, they cannot jump in and be used politically against the president right now because they're, you know, they can't speak. They can't, they're running away from the press right now. They, <laughs> they would just end up defending themselves if they tried to say anything against the president. So it could very well be that this is What's happening in Hollywood right now is a um, operation to neutralize political enemies. But um, but the reason why people would think that why why they would look for cryptic clues like is there a meaning in him drinking Fiji water on on camera? Well, amidst all the the more straightforward information that he drops, QAnon also has all of these very obscure phrases that he uses. He's telling you that they're clues to a mystery he implies that there's these big government secrets that are going to be disclosed having to do with, I mean, at first people thought it was aliens and he said, because he said something about benevolent ETs and that that would be on down the road after the coup happens, we'll disclose the existence of benevolent ETs. So that's the way most people took that. But then he put, he put out a bunch of other stuff that I saw and I understood the meaning to that I don't think very many people have. But he's implying that there's more to the geography of the world than what we're told. And I don't know, I don't myself have a complete theory about what the geography of the world is. But this is a this is something that I subscribe to at this point. I would say most definitely. I think that... There's territory in the world that we don't know about. And it could be everything from what has become quite popular now, the idea of, you know, Antarctica is really an ice wall. Uh, the territory we see on our map is really a, 
something that occupies a flat surface, not a ball, and that there's other stuff beyond the ice wall that we don't even know about. So that's the modern and popular flat earth theory. That is one example of, you know, how you could think about this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also just entertaining the general idea of what I was saying before about there being another dimension, but it's not just something that you have to, you know, take a bunch of drugs to experience or something. I'm thinking you could actually just go there and see it if you knew the right places to go where you would, it would be literally like climbing a mountain that's high enough. So when you get to the top, you can look down and see all sorts of things that you couldn't see before that you didn't even know existed because you're seeing it from a higher perspective. So I'm thinking that this is what he's implying. And I, I would, I would really have to kind of go through, I probably need to go on my website to remind myself some of the things that have been said. And a lot of it has happened even recently. I haven't had a chance to respond to it yet, but I've seen it at this point. Okay. <laughs> I know this is going to sound pretty wild, but okay. People think that QAnon is so close to the president that he might even be the president himself. That's been implied in some of the posts. You can tell that it's this, there's, there's one, one um, identity that's posting the stuff that's really from him, from, from QAnon himself. Because when other people go in there and they try to pretend to be him, they don't have the same what they call trip code. They're not, they don't have the same ID that's identified with his posts. So, so we know what has actually come from QAnon. And some of the things that have come from him specifically really do make you think it's the president himself. Plus, there's things that the president has said in his own posts on Twitter and even in public where it seems like he's acknowledging it. So the other day he posted something, you know, it was on this place called magapill.com. And he was posting a link to what was supposed to, it was a list of his accomplishments. But if you go, if you were to just click from that link that he linked to on his Twitter to the main page of this website, magapill.com, the first post you would have seen it on that day that he did it on Twitter was about QAnon. So other people picked up on this right away and said, hey, look, the president's linking to this crazy conspiracy site. But he didn't acknowledge that and he kept the link up. I don't know. I saw it like over 24 hours later. It was still there. But the website itself, magapill.com, had been attacked. And the guy had, who run, ran the website said, we're under attack. We're, you can't silence us. We're, we'll be back soon. So someone hacked this guy. It's obvious because it's. The reason why is because here's the president linking to a website that's telling you about QAnon and, and that is serious. It legitimizes it. And so I, yeah, I absolutely think that that website was taken down, down probably by spies from the state because they didn't want to legitimize this. Now, I don't know how real it is in terms of, is this guy really from the president? But I don't think it's just what uh, the critics try to tell you, which is uh, that, you know, it's some loser in his mom's basement pretending i mean this is it's either what it presents itself as which it probably isn't there's nothing ever is or it's you know a psyop where they're you know it's it's we're seeing a war between factions and they're putting it on the internet you know they're using the people of 4chan to have this information battle and the character of QAnon is a way of doing it but so what that means to me is either way, the president is in on it to some extent. And you can kind of tell from the things he's posted. Uh, there's another thing where he did plus, plus, plus uh, in one of his emails or his tweet, one of his tweets. And he put that, it, I'm, I'm talking literally three plus signs plus an exclamation point. He put that at the end of one of his tweets and it was just seconds apart, they said, from when the same code was posted by QAnon on, on one of the first posts on 4chan. So things like that definitely indicate the president is in on it. Okay. So, so the president's in on it and, and there's all sorts of hints in the material that what is being claimed to be disclosed in the future has to do with, like I was saying, other territory that's hidden by the manipulation of our perception of light. And 
therefore our ability to see the other dimension. And uh, I can get I can get into that a little bit more. Um, I don't know if you've seen. I mean, have you have you looked at I guess the the stuff that I put up the last week or so? Probably. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about here was this idea of a plus ultra secret society, how that connects to Disney's Tomorrowland. Just yeah. I know you've done a couple of posts on that and that I think also connects to these these what you're calling hidden hyperspace kingdoms and yeah, I would yes. love for you to to flesh those ideas out. Yeah, well, you're mentioning about the hidden hyperspace kingdoms. That is something that I've been writing about recently and connects directly to the plus ultra idea. In ways that I didn't even know about until a uh, you know, maybe a year ago. So what I'm talking about is the hidden hyperspace kingdom is a place that exists and is hidden from the perception of most people by some sort of manipulation of dimensions, manipulation of your perception of light, holographic basically. But so people can live there and no one else will know that they're there. And I absolutely think at this point that these things exist and the elite know about them and are utilizing them all the time. And there's just places of safety that they go whenever they f- want to. And whenever they feel the heat from, you know, regular Earth, they go somewhere else. So we're used to hearing that the elite go off into what they call private islands and they hide their money in offshore accounts, especially when they think they're going to get taxed or they might get arrested or something. Uh, well, I think that they go further than that. I think there's actually other places where there's hidden territory and property and wealth and raw materials and technology that we don't know about. And I think the best way to understand it is to think about some of the ways that it has been represented fictionally. So the examples I like to give are ones, something that uh, a lot of people are familiar with, the Atlas Shrugged novels. Or there was one novel, and then actually the, some of the ideas were explored in other writings of Anne Rand's as well. But in Atlas Shrugged, the elite of society actually do go off into another place. They call Atlantis, and they hide it with some kind of special technology. It's in the Rocky Mountains, and, and they have basically a, a hidden force field over it, so you can't see it from the air, and no one knows it's there. And this is where they go because they in that novel – Society is falling apart. Basically, people are businesses are getting taxed too much and creative people aren't being rewarded for their efforts. So therefore, they all go off in disgust to this this hidden world. So that that's one example. Um, another example from literature about, I would say, the 1930s is the work of René de Mall. He wrote a novel called Mount Analog, and he never even finished it. But it's had a lot of influence in literature. The idea is that there's a mountain in the world. It's bigger than any other mountain in the world. It's on an island that's a bigger continent than anything in the world. Uh, And this is all actually in the Pacific Ocean, but you can't see it because it's made of what he calls paradam, which is a form of diamond, but it's harder than regular diamond. And it's so dense that it actually bends light. And that's why you can't see it. It's creating a gravity. He believes in gravity. It's creating this uh, force that's, that's bending the light so that you can't see it. And also, if you were sailing, it would turn the currents so that you, your ship would just go right around it and you wouldn't even know it was there. Now, I don't think he has all the technical details down exactly for how it's working, but he's got ra- actually pretty close to describing what I think is going on. And I think saying that it's in the Pacific Ocean, uh, well, he may have something there. Because his argument was that, he was talking about the fact that there's a, there's a half of the globe, if you look at it as a globe, where most of the land mass is on that side. There's really only a couple things. There's Australia and then a couple of islands, really, on the other side. Oh, and Antarctica, supposedly. So there's there's actually a term in geography for this called the hemisphere of land and the hemisphere of water. If you go to Google Earth and and, uh, just look at the Pacific Ocean, you can turn the ball in such a way that it's everything is blue completely from their perspective. You know, that half of the ball is completely water. And so Rene Damal was saying, well, there's got to be something else there gravitationally balancing the planet. 
So that was his whole idea was based on that. He dreamed up the existence of this mountain because it seemed like physically it just had to be there. But it, of course, matches up with what people have been saying since ancient times about where the gods live and the idea that there's a pole holding up heaven and it, that it is this mountain, in fact, that Atlas is, in fact, a, a mountain or a pole that's so high that the top of it you can't even see from here because it's in another dimension and it's holding up heaven. It's holding up that other dimension. So that's what Rene Damal was describing. And I think it does exist. I, I don't know if it's exactly what he was thinking because he was thinking about a round ball earth and just trying to think of what could be in the middle of that, that water that's on the other side, all that water of the Pacific Ocean. But what I'm seeing is just that it could be more complicated than that, I guess. Uh, I think that Donald Trump's, or I mean, not even him, Trump and QAnon's clues that they've put in about Fiji and Malaysia. There's some clues about Malaysia. I think that those are those are pointing to this idea. And in fact, it's very close to Fiji, the place where Rene Damal said that Mount Analog actually is. And strangely, around the time that I figured this out, and I was telling my friend about this, and my friend was telling me about how the antipode of Jerusalem is right around that same place. <laughs> As we were talking about this in a restaurant about a few days ago, at that exact moment, that exact hour of, of time, there was a major earthquake right there in that part of the ocean. And there was a tsunami warning for all the islands that are there. It was just an amazing coincidence. I'm not saying that I have magical abilities or anything like that. Maybe psychic abilities. I'm not saying I caused it, that's for sure. Maybe I picked up on that it was coming. And that's why I started talking about that at that moment. But it was just a weird coincidence. And there's so many in this, uh, this story. But um, to, get, to get to the plus ultra thing and how it really just undeniably connects, I went looking for it. Because at a certain point, I was like, this dude is reading my website. You know, there's no way because he started talking about Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland is another one of those examples. Okay. In Disney World, they have something called Tomorrowland and they also had a movie called that. And then there was even what seems like a role playing game or some kind of video game or something going on on the internet that's related to Tomorrowland. It's called Plus Ultra or Stop Plus Ultra, I think is what it's called, the game. And the, it's because in the story of Tomorrowland, there's a hidden hyperspace kingdom that's called Tomorrowland where the elite and specifically elite scientists go to have and enjoy a society made with technology that they don't think regular society is ready for. So, you know, it's, it's another example of the elite going off and hiding and having, having things that we would love to have, you know, <laughs> Just like in Anne, Anne Rand's story. And then the same thing even was going on in Rene DeMal's story. Like they had an elite society there. Only the chosen could get in to the island if you happened to find it. Even then you were challenged. You weren't just allowed to live there. You, you had, you were given a bill as soon as you arrived. And then you had to get jobs to try to find a way to pay your bill off. And if you didn't, then they killed you. So it's a, uh, this is a, a um, ongoing theme here in literature that I think reflects a reality of what's going on, which is that the, the reason why the elite seem like they're so brazen and unafraid of us is because they really do have places they can run away and hide to. But they know that no one will ever find them. And they have, you know, they're not really that afraid that you might take their money because that's just a fraction of what they have stored up and what their real home is. So this is uh, this is the idea I think that's that's uh, behind Plus Ultra in a way, and Dis the Disney franchise is definitely using it specifically for that meaning. And then I found out that well, I noticed that QAnon kept referring to this using all the same kind of phrases that I was using in my articles. He specifically mentioned Tomorrowland too. He also mentions Alice in Wonderland which is a story about going into a hyperspace kingdom and, and sleeping beauty. Okay. His references to sleeping beauty and uh, especially a lot of them recently, it's, it's obvious again, he's specifically talking about, I think something I wrote in one of my articles. Uh, and I also put it in a, in a video that I put out. So 
beauty is that middle pillar that I was telling you about that is represented in the Masonic tracing boards as being the pole beyond the poles in the higher dimension. Because they, in Freemasonry and also were the place where they got it from in the Kabbalah, the, there's these three pillars and the one in the middle is called the pillar of beauty. There's wisdom and strength and beauty. The middle pillar is beauty. And it's asleep because it's hidden from view. And it only kind of gets activated when you go into it and become aware of it. So and the, the way he, that he was using that phrase, it's very specifically about that. And I'm the only person to have talked about it in any recent times, as far as I know. And I didn't, I didn't get it out of any book either. I, I just sort of saw that, you know, that connection. And uh, so I went looking for plus ultra plus QAnon to see if he'd been to my website because I mean, it's obvious to me, he'd been to my website. I wanted to see if anyone else had pointed that out and if anyone else was talking about it. And sure enough, I found a post that had been made, not by someone calling themselves QAnon, but by W.H. Anon, calling himself a White House insider. But this post was made about a month before the QAnon stuff started. But he was foreshadowing it. He was saying, big things are coming. You just wait and see. You know, there's going to be a big revolution. And talking about how Donald Trump is part of the secret society called Plus Ultra. And they, they pointed out that he's got this phrase in the tiles and wall decorations of his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. And then they talked about how apparently his uncle was, I guess, a nuclear scientist and involved working for um, the Navy and was actually in charge of examining Nikola Tesla's materials, his personal possessions, after he died, immediately after he died. And his job was to do this on behalf of the government to see if Tesla was doing anything dangerous. So Trump's uncle had access to things that no one else has seen since then, they say. And this is this is a fact. I mean, I looked that up and that is true. So what's implied in this post that was made in early September by this person that I'm certain now is... The same person who later called himself QAnon. He's saying the president is part of this thing called Plus Ultra. That there's all this stuff in the world that you don't know about, but he's going to reveal it to you. The world beyond. And, you know, that, well, oh, that, that it's connected to Tesla technology, which implies free energy. And that goes along with the fact that QAnon's, the reason why he calls himself Q is because he has Q level security clearance. And that's a security clearance specifically designated for the Department of Energy. So since the beginning, since a couple or three weeks ago, when he started posting as QAnon, he's been implying that there's free energy coming, free energy technology, and it, which only makes sense because it goes along with the ability to make a hyperspace force field that will make something invisible like what I'm describing. So that's what I, I think that's what's being implied. That's the narrative here. Now, I could be all wrong. I could be totally wrong about, you know, the hyperspace kingdoms and all that. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm believing something that's really just a myth, but I'm reading the, the symbols of the myth correctly and they are using it. They're using the myth. They're using even my interpretation of it. And it's being used by people definitely connected to the White House for psyop purposes, if nothing else. And so that's where I'm at. I'm decoding their, their uh, psyops. They're using my material. We're basically talking to each other. You know, when, when QAnon posts, especially the last week, I know that he knows I'm reading it and there's certain things that are in there just for me. So <laughs> I don't know what to tell you except that we've got this funny little game going on and I'm just waiting to see an actual revelation to show me that it isn't a LARP because as far as I can tell right now, it could still be a PSYOP. I'm hopeful, but you know, I think it'd be great to see some evidence here that this is a well-intentioned, real revolution and not just a psyop. That's where I'm at. 
Yeah, that that is quite a lot of uh, thought-provoking material in there for sure. I mean, LARP or not, it's a fascinating story at the very least. And the way that you were just describing it, how it relates to you personally, that does seem to mimic in a way the character that's based on you and your novel Genuflect, you know, this person who leads this, this really, you know, exciting life and she gets kind of sucked into this I don't want to call it like a geopolitical game because it's much more than that. But did you maybe like sort of hyper sigil your way into this spot here? Maybe so. I mean, I didn't see I didn't see this coming because, yeah, in the novel, the person gets involved with a group of elites in England who I mean, the main character sort of based on me. They're in England getting sucked into this, this conspiracy world where there's a cult of Mithras operating kind of uh, in the shadows doing pizza gate type stuff to uh, you know molesting children and things like that to try to control politicians and she gets involved with this person that's that's blatantly based on Michael Bloomberg and who who literally did just open up an office building where he brought a temp- an ancient temple of Mithras a Roman temple of Mithras from the place that it it had been sitting badly restored down the street back to its original location and now that's the bottom floor, like the basement of his new office building in London. So I wrote a story where a bunch of uh, horrible occult rituals happen there. And the character based on Bloomberg is really this Mithras cultist who is trying to not only take over the world, but kind of uh, turn the world into a, a, a kind of artificial prison and uh, ascend it to a higher realm where, where he's going to rule us from above. That's just kind of a... a short version of the story but what's funny yeah because that's that was a a character based on me becoming involved with michael bloomberg and i've been expecting actually something from bloomberg like some kind of threat or lawsuit or something you know no i don't think that he actually would be successful in suing me because i really haven't done anything wrong i don't think i've broken the law at all and i haven't lied about him at all but I was expecting some some kind of, you know, some action from him so far. And I, I think there may have been, but I think it's all been behind the scenes, nothing direct. I think that he might have uh, helped to get me kicked off the radio the other day when I was on. But uh, <laughs> anyway, because I was talking about him and I was on with like millions of people listening and all of a sudden yeah. I got caught. Wait, was I that on Coast I didn't see having to, to do anything. Yeah, Coast to Coast, yeah. which I've been on, you know many many times before for over 20 years so it was really weird for me to be treated like that all of a sudden and i I think it was probably bloomberg but i didn't see the trump thing coming because you know i'm i have not had a strong opinion about him like i know that everyone really passionately hates him i don't and then there's some people that have these kind of what seem to me to be just childish fantasies about him you know, being able to save them somehow and save save us. And I've always just tried to be skeptical of that. I didn't vote. I don't vote. I don't believe in, I, I don't philosophically believe in voting. So I don't participate. But I guess my opinion about Trump has just been, you know, I hope for the best. Like, I mean, if you were to take it at face value, if you don't think it's all, a sham and uh that he's in on it you know he's that he, that he's faking everything <laughs> then what you've got is a guy that's not part of the club who's actually in charge you know in a seat of what should be a seat of power if you know if they weren't circumventing his his rights he should actually be in control of the military and he should be in control of all sorts of things but we know we know the truth is that there's 17 different security clearances above that of the president and there's all sorts of things going on that they don't even let the president know about and they're used to pushing the president around and he's basically just an actor who goes out and makes speeches so they're not used to someone trying to actually exercise power from that seat if that's what he's actually doing then all i could say is you know i i wish him the best and i it's it's a, a dangerous position to be in obviously that he would have put himself in if it was true, then if he's not lying, then here's a, a wealthy guy who had everything going for him, had no reason to want to muck up his life in any way. And he's put himself, you know, behind in the crosshairs of every sniper in, that you could hire in the world. You know, everybody 
is waiting for a clear shot. And they're open about that. You know, the, the CIA has basically put their own spokesman out on TV to kind of openly threaten to kill the president. And so <laughs> you got to think he's put himself in a very dangerous position. He either did that unwillingly because they've got him by the balls somehow. They've got him on, on camera raping kids or something. And so he's a slave like all of them and he has to play this role. Or he's willingly put himself in danger for some reason. So I hope, all I can say is I hope for the best. I can't tell at this point what's going on. It's very complicated, but it seems like you know, they don't like him. You know, they, the establishment, the, the, uh, ruling class did not want this person to be in power. They do not want him to get his way with anything so that you can't help but be sympathetic to that and hope that he can get his way because otherwise that means they keep, get to keep doing what they're doing. And we know what direction they're marching us into has been going on for a while and you can tell where it's headed. And, you know, I don't even think I need to summarize it for the audience. I think you all know. So <laughs> I don't, uh, I guess what I'm saying is to answer your question. It, yes. It's kind of like my novel because in the, in the novel, Yes, a person who's just an esoteric writer and even a self-published writer at that, of a writer about obscure subjects, which is what I am, uh, ends up being influential in current events in politics because of her influence on the elite, because they are actually into the occult and they end up reading her stuff to try to get information about their own rituals and their own beliefs. And in reality, yeah, I think that does happen that that has happened i mean i have you know for one thing yeah i've seen my uh, my ideas influence the public you know in a way in in many cases you know i i don't want to go over it because it would sound bad i don't like to brag <laughs> i really don't like to come off like an arrogant person and if i would tell you what things in in society really have a lot to do with me and my influence it would sound like i'm very arrogant I can't help but notice, okay? And uh, so I'm not that surprised that things that I've written about end up being used for psyops because they get used for TV, they get used for movies, they get incorporated into the general philosophy of people, uh, you know? And so does it, it, it happens for anyone, anyone who's putting out in, information that's true, that's powerful, that strikes a chord, of course, it's going to influence everybody. So I, I don't have any doubt that I've had an influence. And it, but I also know about magic. You know, meme magic is one example, and that's what you know had a lot to do with what put uh, Donald Trump in power. So in my book itself, I expected it to be kind of magical in a way, and I've been seeing it ever since publishing it. In fact, before then, I, I noticed that things that I would write about would start to happen in real life, even just as I was writing it. And after I published it, it started even more. And so I'm talking about everything from strange anomalies in the sky, like the ones I write about, to geopolitical events, financial events. There have been quite a few of them that correspond to things that were in my novel. But as far as, you know, the fact that this is what it seems like, maybe me writing about hidden hyperspace kingdoms in the very direct way that I did. This is just what I have a tendency to do is just completely open up a whole package of occult symbolism that's been hidden in plain sight, hidden under allegory for centuries. And I'll, I'll come along and start researching that topic and I'll just blow it open. So, you know, I've done that with money. I did that with Baphomet. I did that with the mystery of Rin Le Chateau and the Priory of Zion. And now I'm doing it with Plus Ultra and the, the hidden hyperspace kingdoms. And what that forces the elite to do, the ones that, you know, are the hidden sort of spiritual elite, they know about all of the really weird stuff like this. You know, they're initiated into the really occult stuff. When you bring it out into the open, like I do, then they have to operate within that new paradigm. So I kind of feel like I force the issue. With the hidden hyperspace kingdoms. It's, it had already been coming out. It was about to come out because flat earth was becoming very popular. And that's just people becoming aware that there's more beyond. There's more territory 
than what they're telling us, that you can't just rely on Google Earth and, and Google Maps to tell you what place it is that you're living in and, and, you know, what direction even is. So, you know, people are primed to look for that, for, for hidden territory. And so, you know, for me to bring it out in the open and say, hell, you got to look at hyperspace too. And you got to look at that as a way. We know that the, the compass doesn't work in the way they tell us it works. It's not telling us the same thing that uh, the mainstream science has always said. It means something else. The directions mean something else, you know? Mm-hmm. And so now people, you know, enough people know that, that it's, you know, the, the elite have to now cop to that and explain it and say what side they're on, basically. If Donald Trump already knew that and the Rothschilds already knew that and Donald Trump really is against the Rothschilds, which is what he's implying with the, the QAnon posts, well, then now that I've revealed that there's hidden hyperspace kingdoms, they have to tell you what, what side they're on. So Donald Trump is saying, oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm on your side, people. I'm going to show you the hidden hyperspace kingdoms and I'm going to let you have all, access to all the wealth and land that's there. You need to be on my side because these other people, they're trying to hide it from you. Well, he wouldn't have said that before, I don't think. And, and you know, because he would have sounded crazy. But now, and probably because also he wanted to keep it secret for him too, you know? There's no reason why they want to reveal their secrets. But once it gets revealed in a way that they can't put it all back in the package, you know, and they can't hide it anymore, then they have to start dealing with it. That's what I think is going on. Well, shit, Tracy. I mean, that is a, people should just go research it because we don't even have enough time to dig into some of the, the even more esoteric aspects of just the 4chan stuff. But I mean, you've done a good job so far of, of breaking that down. I want to but, apologize for not putting in a lot of details of, you know, interpretation of symbolism. But the reason why is because I would have to explain every single sim- symbol and that would end up being another several paragraphs of me talking and I don't want to ruin the total flow of what we're doing here, but I've got some articles on my website that explain this and I'm going to be doing more. In fact, I, I basically, I'm going to have to, by the end of this week, put out a video explaining everything about QAnon and how it relates to what I just talked about, the plus ultra concepts, because only when you see it all put together like that, will you see, you know, I'm not just projecting this and, and, and seeing a reflection of myself and everything that, you know, I'm not making this up. It really is there. And once you see that, it's really going to blow your mind, guys. But yeah, if I, if I explain to you all these weird little phrases and what they mean, it'll just take too long. So that's why I'm being vague and I'm sorry, but I just have to. No, no, it's totally cool. And I think the best way for people to absorb this information is to get it on their own, you know, like that's, I think the, the way that I don't want to say that you convince yourself that something is, is real and I'm using real in, in quotation marks, but I think it's the best way to absorb information is just to, to digest it on your own. It's one thing to hear two people talking about it on a podcast, but I think it's, it's a lot more impactful on you when you have the space with yourself to absorb it, read it, watch videos about it. We'll definitely link to all your pertinent blogs and your videos on this uh, in the show notes. But I do want to spend some time here, what time we have left, talking about your novel Genuflect. And you kind of summarized it several minutes ago. There's another way to summarize it in just like a few words. And it, I think you wrote it yourself. It's just about an alchemical ritual to sacrifice and regenerate the sun as well as the other classical planets. So, you know, you've talked about this in several other interviews, but for those of us that are not familiar with what that statement means, this alchemical ritual to sacrifice and regenerate the sun, what is that exactly? And how does it play a role in your book? Well, the idea is you would do a ritual where you would entice the spirits that possess the seven classical planets. We're talking about the planets that ancients could see with their own eyes. You're working within a viewpoint where they are spirits are what are called aeons, uh, and they occupy the seven heavens above us. And the sun and the moon are also included in those, those seven classical planets. So each one of those has their own heaven. And so if you did such a ritual, you would be calling down those spirits into physical bodies, enticing them with sex in the sex ritual. Because that's what even the gods themselves, according to myths, sometimes cannot resist. Certain types of sex offered to them if they come down and take physical form. 
So we're talking about a ritual where the seven gods are enticed to come down from heaven into physical form, where they then become vulnerable and can be sacrificed. Then you take the, the sacrificed gods, including the physical bodies that they occupied, and render them alchemically through a physical process to turn them to turn them into a new egg of a new aeon. And, it, and it, what we're talking about really is kind of a new universe. I hate to use that word because, of course, the word universe implies that there's only one, but a new reality, I guess. You know, and that's I, that's really what I think the Gnostics meant when they used the term aeon. They're not the only ones to use it. I mean, it's just a Greek word, but it it's, implies a reality, an entirety of its own. But what's hard to grasp is that you can have one reality supplant another because the reality has time inside of it. It's kind of erroneous to even talk about one coming after the other. But that is the, but that's how we talk, you know, how we talk about the fall in the Garden of Eden as something that happened in the past. Well, that's an example of one reality supplanting another. And we think about it as happening in the past, but it's really a total reality being supplanted. So you can't even really bring time into the equation. When they talk about God creating the heavens and the earth in seven days, and then on the seventh day, seventh day he rested. Well, I've heard people say that the word that's translated as days really means aeon. And so the people that told me that were trying to say that, oh, you know, it's a mistranslation in the Bible. God didn't create the world in seven days. It was seven aeons, which means seven epochs of time, which means that's evolution. And that's, uh, you know, everything that scientists have been telling you. That's what God, that God took a long time to do it all is basically what they're saying. But that's not how I interpret it at all. I think seven, what we're calling seven days are seven aeons, but that's not what an aeon is. You know, it's, it's not just an epoch of time. It's an entire reality. So what, what is being said there in Genesis is that the present reality that we're in was created on top of six others. And on the seventh, on top of the seventh, God rested like he sat down. It's a, it's a floor for him. So that's, it's a, it's a totally new way of interpreting that phrase, but that's, it, it, it makes sense if you start to understand this idea of stacking realities on top of one another. And that's what the role of Atlas is then is to hold up the reality on top of him. Atlas was a Titan. The Titans were defeated in Greek mythology by the Olympian gods. And then God ruled on top of him. You know, Zeus ruled from on top. And we are part of the world that is supporting the realm of the gods that's on top of us. So this is a, a running theme throughout Genuflex. And the reason why, you know, it's part of why it's called Genuflex. It's talking about the role of the subservient, supplanted, enslaved Aeon and the people trapped inside of it. And there, that role in, in regards to the ruling class or the gods that rule above you, you know, whatever is on top of you. So what the villain is doing in my story is trying to escape this prison and be the one on top. And it involves destroying the pillars that uphold, the invisible pillars that hold the realms that are on top. The way to do that involves, like I said, bringing the gods down into physical form and then destroying them. That breaks the pillars. It's actually what's, what, what ends up breaking the pillars in the ritual is the sex itself because the victims of the rape that take place in the sex ritual, they are gods too. And in my story, you know, the one that that gets the, uh, the worst of it, the sort of climax of the ritual that really destroys the foundation of earth and makes the pillars start to collapse is the victimization of a child that has embodied the spirit of Uranus. So that is, that's the realm beyond Saturn. That's the highest heaven that we can, that we have perception of. So when that's brought down into physical form and then violated physically, 
in the most vile way during these rituals, that's that breaks the foundation of reality, basically. It's something that I decoded from rituals and from mythology. And I, I think this is kind of really how it works. Why, this is part of why some really extreme sadistic sex rituals are being performed by certain secret societies, occult sects, whose membership involves, you know, some of the world's elite is because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to f- find their own way to get out of this world and get into and generate a new world where they're the gods of it. And in so doing, they turn our world into something that has fallen, something that has become unreal. And you can build something on top of it. This is how I see, for instance, Atlantis. Like in my view, Atlantis still exists. It's just under our feet. It fell and it fell from reality into non-reality. And the Titans being in Tartarus, it's the same thing. They fell into Tartarus. They fell beneath us and they're upholding us just like Atlas is. They're the foundation for us. But because of that, they're not real anymore. They're not alive anymore. And therefore they've been supplanted. So when it comes to the sun and its connection to this process, what is that exactly? Because that might be a little complex for people to digest on their own. So if if you could boil it down, like this idea of replacing the sun with a new sun, and that sort of ushers in this new aeon. Well, think about it this way. You're like Noah, right? Once you just, you box up the old world and make it into like a little video game that you have in a box, you can stand on top of it and generate the new world from the egg that you've created alchemically from the bodies of the gods of the previous world, right? Well, what first thing that comes from the egg, and you can check this from the the chemical wedding of, of uh, Christian Rosencrutz, where they go through this step by step. In the other alchemical works, it's a, it's a little bit harder to follow the steps. But in the Christian Rosencrutz story, they, they lay it out. So what you do is in from the egg comes a, the sun and the moon, the, the new mommy and daddy of the new uh, order of gods. All right. So first you get a male and female come out of the egg and they breed. And from that, the other five planets come. But you're the one, you're the god, you're the uh, alchemist who brought the egg into the new world in the first place. And this is actually told, this story is part of um, the myth of Mithras. If you if you actually put together all the divergent stories of Mithras and put them together into one biography, what you get is a character who is seen coming up out of the ground, basically, out of a rock. He's seen emerging, being born from a rock with a torch in one hand and a knife in the other. He comes into this world, he conquers all of the gods of this world, and with each god that he conquers, he conquers another heaven, he ascends higher and higher up the different steps of heaven to get to the higher realms. Then he bursts through Uranus, through that highest level that we associate with the fixed stars. So in other words, through the ceiling of the sky, and he takes over that world. But we don't really know. It's implied that he takes over that world. He's the new sun. That's how he was worshipped. But the way I see it, this is all one story. And it never has an end. Because once he goes up through the top, he's seen in the next world coming up through the bottom. Coming out of the rock. That's how he gets born. And this is exactly, you know, I haven't mentioned this in the interview yet, but a lot of ideas I get from my research sometimes come to me through uh, Ouija board seances that I do with friends and family every now and then. And recently we were talking to Mithras after I wrote my novel, Genuflect, that had all the Mithraic stuff in it. I wanted to ask Mithras if, you know, what, what I had said was true, if I correctly interpreted his mythology. And I asked him if he had ever, if he knew what was beyond the fixed stars, beyond the realm of Uranus, and if he had ever been there, you know, if he could describe it. And he said he didn't know what was up there. And I said, did you ever try to go up there? And he said, yes. So I said, what happened when you went up there? And he goes, the, the planchette 
went all the way up through the top of our board. And our board is specially designed so that it kind of looks like the inside of a Masonic lodge. And there's actually a ceiling on the top decorated with little tassels. So the planchette, in order to represent what happened to Mithras, he go, the planchette goes all the way up through the ceiling represented on our board. Then it went off the board and slid underneath it and tried to go as far underneath it as it could. And when I grabbed the planchette and put it back on top of the board, it went down to the bottom and then up again. So it was showing me this loop. And, and then I asked, is that what you, is that what you were telling us that, uh, that you went in a loop? And he said, yes. So, and it took me a couple months to realize after hearing that on the Ouija board, that that's actually what the myth of Mithras tells you. Cause on one end of the myth, they're telling you about him conquering the realm beyond the sky, the hyper Uranian realm. And then you just have to put that together with the story of his birth and you realize, that's what's going on. He keeps trying to get out of the matrix, but every time he gets out, he just comes back up through the floor of the next one. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think there's a, I think there's a ritual to try to, try to conquer this, try to conquer the world you're in and become the god of another one. But I don't think it always works out. And I think that's an example of what can go wrong. And maybe that's what always happens. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know either, but, uh, it's, like I said, it's fascinating. I have two more things I want to touch on. The first is it connects to this directly, but it's this goddess Cybele. And you say in your book was symbolized by a stone. And I think Cybele is one of those uh, characters that is not really well known enough. So could you tell us a little bit about who Cybele is and how she connects to your story and then what this stone symbology really means with her? Well, I think as far as the stone symbology, I'll just say right now, I think that the stone is like the cosmic egg. It's a cosmic egg of a universe or reality. So she came from one of those and she is one of those too. So, she, so she's, you know, it's just like being a, being a female, you came from a woman and you also have the ability to be a mother. Um, and that's what she is, but she's, but whatever it is, that is the womb she came from and the womb she is can be represented to us as a stone. Now, it's hard to say exactly what that is, but I think we kind of have the right idea when we think about an, you know, artificial simulation and th think even it like is a, a board game, board game that's boxed up, you know, it's all in a, in a container. And if you're on the outside of it, it just looks like a box on the inside. It looks really complicated, but on the outside, it's just a box. So it's kind of like a stone. And I think it could even literally be a stone. If you think about it as a, like a crystal that has very complex facets inside of it, because the way that light moves through the facets of crystals is itself a language. And I know they even build computers based on this now and are predicting that they'll have even more amazing computers in the future, specifically based on this, what I'm describing here. It's also, that's a, something that even is used in ritual magic that's this is what uh, john d's enochian magic was uh, you know um, it's a language of the the way that the angles that light light takes when it goes through crystals now and also i just want to point out even in the bible they uh compare god and his kingdom to stones and they talk about the new jerusalem being this giant cubic crystal and then you can go inside of it and when you go inside and actually see God sitting on his crystal throne, he himself is a stone. They, they describe him as being a crystal. So now it could be that there's more to it. Like when, when you finally get into that higher dimension, that you can see it in a different way. But to our eyes right now, if we were to see God and his, his uh, New Jerusalem kingdom, it would look like a stone. So I think, you know, maybe when they talk about Cybele or I guess I've been corrected a few times now. People told me I'm supposed to say Kybel or Kabeli. That I think that that's a, it could be a similar thing. And usually she's said to be black. But again, that doesn't mean that she was always black because stones can absorb light and change color over over time due to their exposure to various types of light. So just to, to briefly summarize her myth, myth and how it connects to everything I've been talking about. Um, so she was supposedly born from a rock and born a hermaphrodite. 
in Olympus, in the realm of the gods. And they thought that she was a freak because she had both sex organs. So they castrated her and then kicked her out of heaven and she fell down to earth. And then she somehow got pregnant and had a son. And then she was in love with her son and got jealous when he wanted to marry another woman. And so then she inspired him with madness and to castrate himself and let him die of bleeding to death. And then a few days later, she felt guilty about that and resurrected him. And that's how he became Addis and her sort of co-regent as a, as a goddess, you know, ruling. And she's kind of thought of as the goddess of the state. Like she was a very, very much associated with the state in Rome and, uh, you know, the upholding of order. And her, her priests were all castrated men who were, would then from that moment on be called priestesses and they would speak in a high pitched voice and, and act effeminate and be considered women. So, you know, she's a castrated hermaphrodite. Her priests are castrated men and, uh, you know, she's associated with the state. And it was a, a, um, cult that was imported from Anatolia and Persia into the Roman Empire and, and made into sort of a state cult as well. Well, similar thing happened with Mithraism. It was also imported from Persia. It was oftentimes that those two cults were running in the same families. So you, you would have, well, Mithraism was an exclusively male cult, but a lot of times, the men of one family would join the Mithras cult and the women would join the Kybel cult. And then the, I guess those men in the family that were oriented towards attracted to being the, the priests of, of Kybele and, and wanted to become castrated and act and become feminine type priestesses, then they would, they would uh, join that. But these, these two cults were definitely connected even though they were separate in some ways and in seemingly at, you know at, at odds in some ways because well because of uh, their attitude towards sex so in the mithras cult like i said it was only men mithras himself was said to really distaste women he did not like women at all and in fact when he wanted to breed a, a son of his own he was said to have ejaculated onto a rock and, you know, it became because he he was born from a rock and they said that lightning inseminated his rock. Right. So he somehow did the same thing to a rock and that became his son, D. Orphos. And you can tell from the name Orphos that we're talking about the Orphic egg. So he's creating another reality in the same way the one he came from was created. But uh, but you have in the story of Mithras this idea of not liking women, not liking normal you know, male, female, female sexual relations at all. Kybele or Kybele or whatever, she was said to not like either men or women. And so that's why she chose to be something in between. And she wanted her priests to be something in between also. So here you have these two cults that are kind of against normal sex roles and against normal sexuality. And even in, in Mithras, you know, they were kind of against marriage and it would, there were members that were married, but it was sort of looked down upon and you were thought of as a, a higher person if you could refrain from relations with women. Well, they had the same kind of um, attitude in the Templars. And that's been revealed to be the case even just a few years ago when they they released the Chinon document, the Chinon parchment. The Vatican released it. And, and this is a contemporary document where the, the Templars confessed to the Pope. And they confessed about their sex rituals, their homosexuality, and by that I mean their policy that when you join, you had to agree to not have any relations with women. And you actually agreed that you would give in to the sexual demands of your brethren in the order to help keep them pure so that they wouldn't be tempted to have sex with women. So we have the same kind of attitude in, in the Templars that you had in the cult of Mithras, but then there's also some connections between the Templars and the Cabelli cult. And I, I think that you see that, that they've absorbed both cults and sort of combined them. And it's probably because they had a common origin in the first place. But the way that you see Templars get buried, the ones that went to crusade, they actually get, got buried in a special way where they crossed their legs 
the way that their bodies are represented on top of their tombs is always in this in this manner with their legs crossed. Well, that also happens to be the way in which Addis was always depicted because he, he always looks like he just got castrated and he's holding his crotch and with his legs crossed because he's uncomfortable. That's the way these Templars look when they're represented on their graves. The other thing connecting those two cults with the Templars is the deity or demon Baphomet that they worship. Because Baphomet is, well, for one thing, his name is connected to Mithras. Uh, Alistair Crowley said that the name could be rendered as Father Mithras. And then he pointed out a, a lot of other connections between symbolism associated with Baphomet the uh, cornerstone of the Temple of Solomon, and and then the fact that Mithras is, is said to be a stone. Alistair Crowley was describing Mithras as being the cornerstone of the temple and saying that that's what Baphomet is too. Well, in addition to that, there's also the connection with Cabelli because really one of the, the biggest sources of information that occultists have always had about what Baphomet was is this book that was only until recently in Latin, and I've had it translated into English, but this book has influenced everything that has been written about Baphomet since about 1820 when it came out. And that's called Mysterium Baphometus Revelatum by this guy, uh, Hammer Perkstall, Joseph von Hammer Perkstall. And th what this book has is a bunch of illustrations of artifacts that were found on former Templar properties where they have depictions of the idols that they worshipped in their secret rituals and depictions of the rituals themselves, the sex rituals with children and animals. And in these depictions, they show what Baphomet really was. And you can tell that it is Kybele, but she's been castrated. It's a, it's, well, it's a male, a male that has been castrated and made into a goddess. And the way that, that this, uh, this being is depicted in these artifacts, it's consistent with the way Kybele was depicted, having this crown of towers on her head and uh, and several other things that, that are the same. But even though the myth of Kybele w was that she was a, a castrated hermaphrodite, that was never depicted in the imagery. Like you never in, in Rome, in, in that Kybele cult, they never just showed Kybele naked with, you know, a, a hole there where her genitals, her male genitals used to be. But that is what's shown in these Templar artifacts because they were practicing the secret aspects of Kybele's worship, which I don't think were ever even really documented in Rome. But, and so maybe they made it up, maybe they added on to it, but it's possible they just inherited it from the original Kybele cult. But we, we know that the, the uh, Templars were influenced by the Cabelli cult. Even the Church Fathers uh, implied that the Gnostics had absorbed the Cabelli cult. And then we know that every commentary that has been made about the Templars, where the writer believes that they were guilty of blasphemy and, and you know, her heretical practices, every writer says that they were practicing Ophite Gnosticism. So Ophite Gnosticism has been documented that it, it involves, it has absorbed the Kybele cult. And it, it's, you know, it's all part of the same doctrine. So what I'm telling you is that Baphomet, this entity that was worshipped by the Templars, and that the Templar Baphomet worship thereafter influenced the Freemasons and modern Satanists and almost every modern Western occult group. Well, that came from both Mithraism and the Kybele cult. And, and it seems that the figure of Mithras and the figure of Kybele are related figures. If they're not the same person, then they're related. And it seems like maybe Kybele is mom and Mithras is the child. And it's just, you know, at some point in the story, he gets castrated, which would explain why he hates women so much. But of course, Mithras was never represented as a castrated figure. He's always represented as being, you know, virile and strong. But like I said, his story is out of order. You know, it's, there's, there's no linear way of telling the story of Mithras because we're talking about a guy who's been beyond the sky and back. So, you know, the fact that he's, he's, he's got a myth. It doesn't mean that 
the myth tells everything in order. You know, he, he's probably the son who at one point created his own world by ejaculating onto a rock. And then at another point in his story, he's been castrated by his mother. And, you know, Mithras was always also associated with Saturn specifically. And the, the highest, the priest of their order was always called Pater and associated with Saturn, called the father. Saturn, according to, you know, his myth in, in the Greek mythology, his role was to be born out of the chaos out, and out of the egg, the, the original egg. Like Uranus and his wife Gaia, well, originally they were one hermaphroditic being and they were basically one closed egg and they had, you know, a baby or several babies inside of their womb, but they didn't want to let the babies be born or at least the male portion called uh, Uranus didn't want to let the babies be born because they were afraid what would happen afterwards that they would be that he would he was afraid he would be supplanted but the way that reality got started and the way that 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 supplantation that supplanting actually happened was Saturn cutting himself out of the womb so they have the story of of uh, Saturn overcoming his father Uranus who wanted to keep him inside of his mother's womb they don't actually come out in the greek myth and say oh it was a hermat- hermaphroditic de- being and everyone was trapped inside its womb they use other f- phrases but you know when you put it all together then you can tell that's what what they're saying because they say that in order to get out of the womb he castrated his father well so i mean he castrated him while you know the penis was inside there obviously and that was the plug holding him in. Or, I mean, I think an even more complete way of thinking of it is that there, there were never separate sex organs in the first place. There was just one big enclosure inside of which other creatures were being created and multiplying. And they wanted to get out and there wasn't enough room. So he cut his way out. And in so doing, he castrated his father. And that's what started everything. That's how heaven and earth, which were originally this one thing, Gaia and Uranus, got separated. And we're the realm that we're in now is the realm that exists in between them. This is the way the Greek myths are describing it is we're standing on top of Gaia. We've got Uranus ahead on top of us and as a canopy and what's holding it up is Atlas. So there's this pillar keeping the two things separated so that we can exist. And if it ever got cut, then those two things would slam back together again. And we'd be trapped inside and existence would basically be snuffed out. So what the Mithras myth is telling you is that he cut himself out of the womb. Or I'm sorry, what the Saturn myth is telling you is about him cutting himself out of the womb. And that creates the world we're in. Well, if you just connect that to the story of Mithras cutting himself out of a rock, then you see that that's the same story. Basically, what we have with Kybel and Mithras, I think, are the story of that son who has to cut himself out. And also the story of the mother. And what her experience was like in this whole thing. And, and together, those two creatures have influenced what became the entity known as Baphomet and the worship that the Templars engaged in, which it seems to me from my decoding, in particular of the, the artifacts put forward by, by Hammer Perkstall, that they were, they were conducting this exact, exact same ritual that I'm talking about. This was the baptism of wisdom. Okay, that common rendering of of Baphomet's name is that it means baptism of wisdom. Well, they're referring to the ritual that they, I I would say, were practicing for. They weren't necessarily doing the real thing because they were just warming up to it, trying to figure out how to do the real thing. But what it is, is doing a ritual to destroy creation and escape and become the gods of a new realm. So that's what I've been describing to you for this whole story, or for this whole conversation. This is what I think the Templars were involved in and what I think Baphomet, their deity, was instructing them on how to do through divination. They said that they talked to Baphomet and he gave them wisdom. This is what I think they were telling him how to do. Uh, they, I mean, this is what I think he was telling them how, what to do and how to do. And uh, this is the meaning, I think, of Templar Baphomet worship. And I think that there's, a, there's several groups today that are still trying to do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, you've written extensively on this topic in your book, Baphomet, The Temple Mystery Unveiled, I believe is the title, right? Yes. And, uh, but the last thing, Tracy, that I want to touch on before we go here is diamonds. You write about diamonds in 
your book, Genuflect, you've also written a couple blog entries that, that relate back to this symbolism of, of the diamond and how it relates to Superman, for example, how it relates to Bloomberg, how it relates to even this crystalline sun that you touched on a, a few minutes ago in your explanation there. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the importance of the diamond and how it plays a role in your story and then also how it plays a role in our reality. Well, I think that the best way to think of it is the, the metaphor I keep using about the deck prism, which is an object that they used to put in ships in the floor of the deck so that below deck, the light would shine through this crystal that's embedded in the floor of the deck. Sunlight and moonlight would go through and then it would be amplified and refracted into the whole room. So it's basically, it's an artificial light source, but it's simple and natural, not dangerous in any way because, you know, there's no candle, there's no open flame, there's no electricity. So the reason why I use that as a metaphor is because what I'm talking about here is the idea of the hyper-Uranian sun, which is something they, they imply in Freemasonry and they hardly ever really go into detail about it, but it's in all of their symbols. And then there's something that you hear a little bit about in Greek philosophy, like Plato used to talk about this sometimes. And then there's a few other occult traditions in modern times where they'll talk about it. It's the sun beyond the sun and the sun beyond the fixed sky. Again, to understand the kind of stuff that I've been talking about in this whole interview, you really just have to throw out your disbelief for a minute and try to adapt the more ancient worldview that is only the stuff we can see that exists. So you're not thinking about anything that's been revealed by the Hubble telescope or any of that stuff. You're just thinking about, like I was saying before, the classical planets that, that occupy the heavens above us. And then you've got the fixed sky, the realm of the fixed stars, as being one thing, one realm in itself called Uranus. So anything beyond that is hyper Uranium. You've got these seven steps. The last step is Saturn. And then the realm beyond that is Uranus. Anything beyond that, hyper Uranium. And it really is, Uranus is like the ceiling. And if you were to think of it that way, if you had no other information to go on, then you would almost have to conclude that the sun and all the stars, all the other lights in the heavens are bringing in light from something on the other side of that canopy. So it's just like a deck prism. And the sun then would be the main one. So what I'm talking about is the idea, yes, that the sun actually is a crystal that is bringing in light from beyond the sky. Now, they seem to quite literally depict this in Masonic symbols. When they have the symbol of the royal arch and the keystone. So you'll see an arch, and quite often they'll just actually show you the uh, zodiac signs on the arch. So you can tell it's the... Exactly what I'm talking about. The arch of the sky, the fixed heaven, the fixed stars, Uranus, that realm. And in the middle of it, where the keystone would go in an arch, uh, in architecture, in a building, they have their keystone, which they always represent with an I on it or a G or, you know, the square and compass, one of those central Masonic symbols. They'll put that on the keystone. And sometimes they actually show the keystone removed. It's just been plucked out like a plug from a bathtub. In that case, they always show a sun, uh, an additional sun, because you usually have the sun and the moon on either side of the arch represented. But then there'll be another thing, another light source that looks very much like the sun, usually a little bit bigger, shown shining through the hole in the arch where the keystone has been removed from. So what they're showing you is that there's a window in the sky, a little plug, a little port portal, a hole. And if you unplug it, then the hyper uranium light from the sun beyond the sky can come through. And so in my novel, we have this as, a, as one of the scenes. And, you know, I'll just say that, you know, I, I envision being able to see things that you wouldn't see in normal light. In my story, doing this has a sort of, uh, it's being done very literally in a way that everyone can see, and it's having a very literal, physical effect on the world. But I think that the symbol 
maybe represent something that they can do even on a smaller scale. You know, they can obey the, the Freemasons in their private rituals in their lodge could do something to open up a smaller portal of, and let some of this light in for whatever purposes they use it for. But I think, I think that they're, um, showing us the, the, you know, a secret, something that they know about our world that we're oblivious to. I think it's real. So anyway, yeah, I put, I put this in my story and I, I, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it because it's like, you know, you may just laugh at it or you may think it's the most brilliant thing ever. And it kind of depends on how seriously you take modern science and space research and whether you believe in that stuff or not, because Otherwise, this is just sort of a metaphor and it's, you know, vaguely useful for literary purposes and nothing else. But if you believe that something like this could be literally possible, then it's going to make you look at the sun a lot differently. And in fact, your world a lot differently. I take it seriously. And I take the idea that God could be a stone quite seriously. Like I was saying, that's the way he's described in the book of Revelation. And I don't see any reason why spirit can't be inside of a stone. You know, why would you need flesh and blood to be alive necessarily? You know, uh, the, I think that spirits just need some place of residence, but they don't necessarily need, you know, everything that we have for our physical existence. So they could very well be inside of something that seems to us to just be a crystal and seems like, you know, dead matter. But Really, you could have a spirit inside. It's something that you know, people are in their crystals and, you know, people who believe in the healing power of crystals and stuff like that. Well, this is what they're obviously they're believing that there's a spirit inside the crystal, you know, and also that it can be used to communicate. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. One that you could have something inside of it, which I've been told on the Ouija board. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've been told that Jesus is inside the sun. And the sun is a crystal and that that's the real reason why he's associated with solar symbolism, that he's really actually being crucified now. And he's on the sun cross, you know, he's he's uh, being tortured for our benefit. Now, the sunlight that comes out is from him, that the symbol of the sacred heart, for instance, is just a way of showing you this, that his energy is being bled out upon us and we're benefiting from it. And it takes the form of the light from the sun. So I can see that that could just be a metaphor, but I also have the ability to see ways in which it could be very literal. And I take it seriously in that sense. I tend to do that. You know, I tend to look at mythology and my first instinct is to see how they could actually be telling the truth and any sort of metaphorical usage that can be made of it is usually something secondary that yes, you can make it into a metaphor for, you know, morality or some other thing that you might want to use it for. But usually when you look at an ancient myth that has a lot of weird, peculiar, very specific details to it, usually they're trying to tell you something very specific and real. And so I usually take that that interpretation first. And that's what I see when I look at all of the myths about the sun. And, you know, I said earlier in the story about, I talked about how it seems like there's stories of the sun being killed and replaced. Yes, that's what you see in all of the creation myths. And in the Greek stories, they talk about all the different ages of, you know, starting off with the golden age of Saturn. And then, you know, there was a silver age and an iron age and all these other less evolved ages coming after that. Well, anyway, they're talking about different eras of different suns. I don't think at all. I, I guess now I have a hard time even thinking of the sun as some, you know, atomic explosion in the sky. I just don't. It's been a couple of years now that I haven't even had that thought. It doesn't occur to me anymore, especially now. You know, again, I, I don't want to branch off into too much, but I mean. The sun is totally different to me now than it used to be a few years ago. And it fits more this definition of being a crystal than it ever was before. Just one more thing here. You know, I mentioned the diamond symbolism and Superman, which is in your book. That's an interesting story, I think, that if we could just wrap up on on that 
and how it relates back to everything that we're talking about here because you know superman is an interesting character because when you look at just even overtly it seems to symbolize this alchemical process you know with the red and the yellow coloring and i was just curious you know how you saw that and how that relates back to the diamond symbolism and this artificial sun perhaps well i'll just i'll I'll throw in a few things because there's quite a lot i could say about that which amazed me i i started writing about the superman diamond just on a it was a accident. I was trying to come up with something to say about this plot of land that Bloomberg's building is on in London, which in my story for Jenny Fleck, I have a character based on Bloomberg and he's right there in that same place. So in other words, I changed the details for my novel just slightly and almost everything is, you know, based on reality. And the reality is that the plot of land that Bloomberg's building is on, it's this place called Bucklersbury. And this is the place where the Temple of Mithras originally was, supposedly thousands of years ago in ancient Rome, or Roman Londinium, the Roman city of London. And uh, it looks like a Superman diamond. It has that particular shape. And so I started writing about that because I, I couldn't figure out what else to call it. I mean, I looked and looked for the name of this particular diamond shape. Which you see, you know, if you ask a child to draw a, a diamond, they'll probably draw this shape because it's what people think about now when they think of diamond. But it's specifically the Superman logo or it, it seemed to me like that was the only thing to call it. So I started talking about that in my story and I was just trying to find, find something to add to it. You know, what, I mean, what could be the symbolism of the Superman diamond? And so, yeah, I started writing about the, the name Superman, how, you know, both the way Nietzsche used it and the way Alistair Crowley used it because he was probably the first person to use it in English, the word Superman. And they were talking about a you know, superhuman race to come in the future. Well, Nietzsche was talking about a race to come in the future. And Crowley was talking about breeding a divine being through sex magic. But they're both kind of related concepts. So one of the things, first things I mentioned is, oh, it kind of looks like a womb. You know, it looks like a female pelvis. And I brought up the fact that Superman always wears his underwear on the outside. <laughs> he wears those yellow pound panties that kind of like, <laughs> yeah. drawing attention to that part of his body and to that shape. So I first mentioned that and, and I started making use out of that in the story. Then it all became much more complicated because I, I was already utilizing the fact that next to Bloomberg's building in the same location of Bucklersbury, next door you have the Bank of England and also the ancestral family home of the people that have always controlled the Bank of England, which is the Rothschilds. So there's the Rothschild family building right there next to him. And it's been there since like 1805 or something. And, you know, they actually, their family lived there for the longest time. Their children would be born there. Um, they, they lived there forever. Now it's just an office building. But like I said, it's been there for 200 years. And you know, these are the people that have financially controlled England and therefore, by extension, the whole British Empire and everything that that implies. And now they control all sorts of banks and, and essentially the finances of countries all over the world. Well, the seat of power was right there in this, this one spot in the city of London. And as I discovered, there's a connection with Superman. So here's what it is. For one thing, Lois Lane is based on a woman that the person who wrote Superman, his name's Jerry Siegel, the, who came up with the original comic strip. He used to be in love with this woman whose last name was Rothschild and that was in his high school. And so the character of Lois Lane is based on her. And it not, does not say in any of these articles uh, that are about this subject that she's part of this banking family. But just if you know the, the history of the family, well, they came up with the name. You know, it was a German name. They changed it a little bit. So they, it, the, the family name comes from them. So she's got to be related somehow. Maybe not by blood. Maybe there's a marriage connection in her family's past that, that gave her the name. But one way or another, she is connected. And then, of course, I'm, I start to think, well, heck, the, the Rothschilds, don't they kind of control the diamond industry? It, them and uh, De Beers and, and what's his name? Uh, Cecil, Cecil Rhodes. You know, those were the the main figures in the diamond industry. And nowadays, Rothschild's probably the biggest. So there's that going on in my head and stuff. And then I find out 
what the Rothschild's family's name actually comes from and what it symbolizes. So every you know it, it means red shield, and almost everybody will tell you that it's a red coat of arms with a, a hexagram on it, you know, a Jewish star that they had in their shop window. You know, their their ancestor did their forefather when he first opened up his shop where he was doing money lending and other things. But it's a right except for what was on the sign. So it wasn't a Jewish star. It was a buckler, which is a kind of shield, a small shield that kind of looks like a cone, I guess, or a, 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 um, you know, a half of a circle, but it comes to a point at the end, has a kind of sharp point at the end. And honestly, I can compare this to the culet of a diamond, which is the bottom part. It's usually, it's pointy, but it's also kind of rounded at the end at the same time. But the buckler is actually the red shield their name comes from. But I don't think it was just a, you know, a metal shield to be used in battle. I think it was something more specific. And here's why. I think the buckler that they use as their family symbol actually was all the same as this talisman that they were said to have had. Particularly Nathan Roth, Rothschild, they said, had possession of this talisman that gave him power to be, quote, to become the Leviathan of finance. So he had a magical stone, they said. And diamond, of course, is the hardest stone. The word actually comes from adamant or adamantine. It means, you know, hard, th that you can't break it. So that goes along with the symbolism of a buckler, something that is a shield. And that even goes along with the idea of a diamond as a deck prism, because not only does the diamond deck prism in the sky bring in light from the hyper uranian sun but it also acts as a filter for that light so it's only bringing in the light we can use it's protecting us from the wavelengths that are harmful so this is the kind of thing that i think the rothschild family symbol actually denotes which is this magical object that they've used throughout their their generations to make their family powerful and it just so happens that they chose a location to base their empire in England, in the city of London, on this place called Bucklersbury. And it just so happens that that landmass is shaped specifically like the, what became the Superman diamond. And it just so happens that Superman is in love with a woman that is named after a Rothschild, uh, that is based on a Rothschild. And it just so happens that I wrote a story about an alchemical ritual happening right there in that very location where they're breeding a race of men. And it just so happened that the diamond that we call the Superman diamond, that I've been calling the Superman diamond, well, what that shape really is, is something that was invented in the 1920s called the perfect, round, brilliant cut diamond. And it's the most perfect way of cutting a diamond so that it will refract light into a rainbow with the greatest volume of light and the most perfect colors. And they call that fire when it comes, when you, when you uh, shoot light into a diamond and then it comes out sparkling and scintillating through the top. That's called fire. And in my story, they actually use that as a way of cutting open the sky. So in my story, the diamond that, uh, that is the sort of family heirloom to the Rothschilds is also this thing that's kind of uh, important to the whole world, you know, as a, that it can act as a deck prism, it, it, that it has the power to be the new sun doing the same thing that the sun is presently doing. And it's cut in the shape of a perfect, round, brilliant diamond. Now, even though that was some, that was something that was only in the, invented in the 1920s, in my story, I have it that that's actually a, a secret that has been has been passed down, you know, through initiated alchemists for centuries. And I just made that up, but it is kind of the thing that I think happens a lot. I think that a lot of our technology is based on things that have been around a long time but just kept secret. So it could even be that this cut of diamond is one of those things. Again, I don't know if it's true or not, but 
Uh, we did get, I got a, a lot of very interesting messages on the Ouija board about the diamond, kind of confirming that idea that the round cut brilliant diamond is an alchemical secret that has been passed down. And uh, I also just got a lot of clues kind of handed to me through fate and through coincidence where uh, evidence was brought to me over and over again. He's still point, always pointing to this, this idea. And actually, it's a very specific idea. What it is, is that the shape might have been discovered by John D. And John D., he wrote one of his most important alchemical manuscripts called Monus Hieroglyphica while he was in Antwerp, Belgium. Belgium is where this cut of diamond was invented. And in fact, that's where that's really the center of the diamond trade in the world. And it always has been. And we got messages on the Ouija board about Belgium, specifically the city of Ghent. And one of the most important things, one of the most famous things in the city of Ghent is this thing called the Ghent altarpiece that's there in the cathedral of St. Bavo, also called St. Boffs. And so long story short, the saint of that cathedral, his name is kind of like Baphomet's name. And etymologically, they're even directly connected. And then the Ghent altarpiece, that is the main piece of artwork that that cathedral is famous for, and really the whole city is famous for, shows the sun in the New Jerusalem. And it shows all these crepuscular rays coming out of it. And they totally look like the shape of the the cuts in a diamond. It looks like it's being refracted very directly out of a diamond. So I think I think that the message is imbe- embedded there. Oh, and another, another thing connect. An interesting thing about Ghent, their whole symbol, the like the town symbol is a goat, and they have um, yeah. a festival every year called the Goat Parade, where they celebrate the symbol of the goat and his connection to Saint Baths. So I totally think there's a Baphomet connection to that city, and that it has that. That city is somehow the place connected to this diamond that I'm talking about and this diamond magic or this diamond alchemy that I think exists and, you know, the secret is, has been passed down for generations. And I think the Rothschilds are part of it. And that's why they have buried beneath several layers of symbolism a reference to it in their own coat of arms where they have the buckler. And... I guess I'll stop there, but I mean, you know, there's a <laughs> there's a lot to say about those subjects. The Rothschilds, Superman, and the Diamond, they're all connected, and there's so much to say about it. Yeah, there definitely is. But one more just small detail about John Dee and his connection to diamonds in general, too, was that number 58 that you mentioned in one of your blogs, where I think you pretty much accused John Dee of being the Demiurge. <laughs> but yes. uh, the whole, like, he had started writing the Monas Hieroglyphica on... 125 January 25th finished it on 331 March 31st and those numbers 25 and 31 or sorry 25 and 33 correspond to that round brilliant cut of the diamond that you were talking about right yes and it corresponds to a number that that was written on one of the Baphomet heads that was confiscated when the the, uh, Templars were arrested that this is written in the logs of all the materials that they confiscated from their temples. One of them is this head called Head 58. So for a long time, I've written about the number 58 as being sort of a code for Baphomet. And so I was fascinated to find out that that's the number of facets that are in this diamond. And only if you count the culet, which is, like I said, this rounded thing on the end of the diamond, and one of the other interesting things that I've noted recently in connection to the number 33 and this, this diamond, the UN's logo, okay, they have 30, they have the world depicted as an azimuthal projection from the North Pole. So all the land, all, everything that's in the world on the map is all spread out in a circle with the North Pole in the center. And then they have it cut up into 33 sections. There's like a grate that's put on top of it. And it has 33 sections. And, of course, people have always thought, well, this has to do with Freemasonry. But why do the Freemasons use this? Here's why. Because there's 32 points on a compass, on a regular compass uh, with, you know, the four cardinal directions. They'll divide that up into degrees so that there's 32 degrees. And, of course, there's 32 official degrees of uh, Scottish Rite Freemasonry. But... There's an honorary degree that they give to some called the 33rd degree. 
And in fact, a lot of people will even say, well, it doesn't even exist. It's a secret thing and only a few people are initiated into it. Well, that's one way of putting it. But the point is that you've got 32 compass points that are, are real on the known compass that measures the known world of three dimensions. But if you add an extra one, a 33rd degree, it's like you're saying, well, there's more beyond, there's plus ultra. There's a compass point pointing up in another direction that you didn't even know existed. And so I think that's what's implied with the number 33 and the way the structure that they have in Freemasonry. I think it's interesting that they have 33 se segments then on the UN flag or the UN symbol where they seem to be covertly telling you about the extra territory that exists in the world. Then you have this diamond where, yes, there's 33 facets, but one of them is curved at the bottom where the North Pole would be represented. If you were to look at the diamond as a represented representation of a map, because yeah, the, the, it's the bottom, everything below the pavilion, the bottom half of this diamond, that's what has 33 on it. So if you turn it upside down, and look at that bottom half as a representation of the world, just like the UN logo. They're showing you 32 segments, just like there's 32 compass points. And then there's an extra one in the middle that's curved. So it's like it's telling you another dimension, another way of looking at space. What looks like an angle is actually curved. That's the extra thing. That's the mountain, the invisible mountain. And you can't see the apex of the mountain because it's up there in the other dimension. So all this stuff connects in, in an amazing way. And I think I've only begun really to understand the meaning of this diamond. I may have to explore it in a future novel because it's like so complicated that if I start just writing nonfiction articles about this and putting it out, yeah, it'll be taken seriously and other people will start repeating it. It will become a phenomenon all its own. But everyone will think I'm crazy. But if I put it in a novel, I think I can get away with it. So yeah. that may be what I do. But I mean, I'm telling you, I can see all this stuff. I, I just don't know. I don't know if the world's ready to accept it yet. I hope you understand what I've been saying and how I, how I see what these symbols are pointing to. Well, I've been trying to understand it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's just so much there. There is definitely a lot more uh, further beyond here for sure. So, <laughs> but I think that's a good place to wrap up on. Do tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. TracyTwyman.com will always work. You can always follow that and find out what I'm doing. I may have various websites that I work on here and there, but if you just go to that, URL, you'll always be able to find whatever my website is these days. And of course, if you want to find my books, you can always go to Amazon. Go to my website and find links to the books. But if you just go to Amazon, you'll find the books themselves. So that's what you should do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tracy Twyman, thanks again for being here. I really do appreciate your time. You are a valuable, knowledgeable resource that I, I just can't get enough of. I, I just love hearing you talk. And it was nice to actually hear you on Skype on the other end of this. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My fucking lord, Tracy Twyman is such a badass. My apologies again for the audio. If you made it to this point, you are a badass as well. And my apologies for not really following up on some points Tracy made. I try to construct each conversation here differently and play to the strengths of the guests. And Tracy's strength is her ability to not only present her research in a, a well-thought-out, straightforward manner, but also her ability to pivot between those sort of sub-points within the main point itself and connect those together and make it at least somewhat cohesive at the end. Because this material, as you may have gathered, can be quite dense to sort through and also present to a general audience, especially on a podcast that, as a guest, you're unfamiliar with. That said, I do appreciate Tracy's willingness to do this and share her time with us. I thought it was a hell of a conversation, or a hell of a Q&A session, I guess. Many thoughts were provoked, I hope. Many feel spots were activated. If you have feel spots activated by 4chan Anons, or Hidden Hyperspace Kingdoms, Hyper Uranian Sun, Cybel, Mithras, Saturn, Diamond Alchemy, or any one of the other 58 topics we danced with. You know, part of what Tracy mentioned during the QAnon portion of the chat up front there alluded to a potential disclosure of quote-unquote benevolent ETs. Now, I'm sure by now many of you are aware of that recent Pentagon UFO story that's had a lot of gears grinding on the internet. 
If you're not aware of it, just search it out. And maybe some of you saw the lights over Los Angeles Friday night that a lot of people immediately said that this was a SpaceX, you know, Elon Musk's company launching a rocket. I don't know what the hell that was, to be honest. I'm not going to recap these stories, you know, just search them out, like I said. And I'm not going to recap them because I just, I find the whole thing to be quite comical. It's entertaining, if nothing else. But looking at it all from the outside without any sort of emotion involved, I just can't help but see the irony here. Like, wouldn't it be ironic if a Trump presidency, the Trump administration, were the were the ones to disclose this mystery of UFOs or the existence of alien life? Because I know a lot of UFO and alien folks who despise Trump. But if he's the one who, say, confirms their beliefs, if he's the one who in their eyes, finally brings this truth to light, well, what do you think they'll think of him then? What will they think of his quote-unquote disclosure? It is funny, too, that most people who talk about conspiracy theories or consider themselves conspiracy theorists or are labeled as such through intelligence propaganda, you know, they're the ones sounding the alarm here that this story, these stories, are bullshit. Again, kind of ironic if you think about it. I could see a scenario where that becomes yet another way to discredit conspiracy theories and theorists. If you have a large group of people who were chatting about UFOs and aliens for decades and sort of shoving that quote-unquote truth down people's throats, if that group suddenly comes out and says a particular disclosure narrative is bullshit, well, what other theories could be presented as real by, say, the media and then dismissed as nonsense by the people who were theorizing them for so long? Is this just some sort of cognitive dissonance? Is this just a a group of people not trusting what another group says regardless of what it is they're saying? Of course, the real issue here is probably far too complex for the average person to comprehend, kind of like the material Tracy is working with. Although, if you can wrap your head around an alchemical sun ritual, you certainly can make sense of the link between, say, UFOs and consciousness, which is still my favorite UFO theory. UFOs certainly do exist in some form or another. I've seen a couple, and so have many other people. It's hard to deny your own personal experience. The nature of them, though, again, that's where things get tricky and sticky. The problem is, and the reason a lot of people are calling bullshit on these stories is, they're bringing in the alien angle. It's a a soft play so far, but they're still bringing it in, as if the two are somehow connected, and we know they're not. I think we also know stories like this are just another vehicle to not only distract you from something else, but also act as a way to centralize more power and resources so these elite types can fund more of their diamond alchemy and hidden hyperspace kingdoms. At the end of the day, that's what all the geopolitical theater is about. It's a magic trick in and of itself. You know, look up here at the shiny trinket in my right hand while I shove the magic handkerchief into my pocket with my left hand. And by the way, I am sick of calling these people elite. I think using that language gives them even more power over us and makes their magic and alchemy even stronger and more potent. I've been thinking about what I would call them instead, and I think just putting a D at the beginning of the word makes a ton of sense. The deletes. Because that's what we should do. We should delete them. Anyway, if you pressed me on what I think is going on with this Pentagon UFO alien lights over LA stuff, it's a big, fat, fucking LARP, and I don't think it takes many brain cells to figure it out. Just my opinion. No facts. No data. Just a hunch. Could be wrong. Whatever. But I also think this QAnon thing is a LARP, too. It does seem to have a few more legs to stand on. It's taken on a sort of spidery appearance in that sense. I mean, it is all very, it's all very, very entertaining. But it's just another distraction. And a group of people somewhere will use it against us to again centralize power and resources for themselves. Because we're doing the one thing they want us to do. We're paying our attention to it. And that will keep most of us chained to this system that forces us to exchange our precious, precious energy and time for worthless material, numbers on screens. Hope you didn't lose too much in Bitcoin recently, by the way. This is just another way to keep focused on everything else but yourself. 
all your attention diverted to something external while your internal continues to lack it. So I guess my point is stop giving away your attention. That's valuable currency, man. It's the only currency. If it wasn't, they wouldn't spend so much fucking money marketing and advertising to you to try and get your attention. Hope you got some good gifts for Saturnalia, by the way. But I want to ask you guys something, and this is a question I wish I could get out to a larger audience and start a dialogue with it. So do me a fave, share this episode whenever and wherever you can, because this is what we need to be asking. At the end of the day, does it matter what the nature of UFOs are? Does it matter if life exists elsewhere? Does it matter if a bunch of slick-dicked rich Martian wannabes build a hidden hyperspace kingdom? How does that change your life? Does it change your life? Does it affect your day-to-day in any way? Are you going to be able to quit your job? Stop paying bills? Stop paying debts? Or is this all just another magic trick that commands your energy and attention in order to be successful. Because I'll tell you, that's the resource they are most concerned with centralizing. Not money, not oil, not data, not the rule of law, not food or water. It's your focus that they want. And wherever it goes is what wields power over you. So if you give that focus to government or to the deletes, yeah, you're liking that word now, aren't you? If you give your focus and attention and energy to these people and their creations and their institutions, guess who and what is wielding power over you? Look, you are on your own here, and you always have been, and you have to come to terms with that. You have to take care of yourself first and foremost and then help those near and dear to you when you can. There's no such thing as a strong couple or family or community unless there are also strong individuals who are part of it. So in the chance that any of this UFO alien stuff is real, if it actually shows up on your doorstep, and I doubt that it will, but in the chance that it does, it's best To be the strongest, brightest, most badass version of yourself that you can be. Otherwise, what good are you going to be during the War of the Worlds? And hey, if that ridiculous rant didn't convince you to support this show, I don't know what else I can do. But if you want to, hit up oculturepodcast.com slash support. You can also grab a t-shirt at oculturepodcast.com slash store or at the Etsy link in the show notes. Or you can drop the show a five-star rating and review on iTunes. I actually think I'm going to start reading those reviews on air. I started doing that a while ago and then I stopped. And I think I want to start doing it again because I'm going to give away some stuff to people who have reviewed the show and who do so in the future. We're up to 24 five-star reviews now. That's really cool. Let's get to 25 by the new year. And you know what? I'll throw in a little something for the next person to write a review not just going on there and clicking five stars i'm talking going on there writing a review of the show doesn't have to be long a few words sentence or two give it five stars give it a few words and i'm going to send you a copy of tracy twyman's genuflect how about that hermes christmas gift us at it again shout out to dana terrell and a shout out to each and every one of you who continue to spend your time here with me. One more episode to drop in 2017. And then 2018 is going to get got in a big, big way. But until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
time this cassette.